Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Cornerstone, and welcome to our online audience as well. Uh, I'm going to suspend our study through the Gospel of Luke just for today. We're going to carry on with it next Sunday, Lord willing. But instead, this morning, I felt led to teach on this subject of life, on this Sanctity of Human Life Sunday. On January the 22nd, 1973, the U.S. Supreme Court legalized abortion across this country in, uh, in the Roe v. Wade decision. Eleven years after that, President Ronald Reagan issued the first proclamation declaring the third Sunday or the fourth, whatever is closest to January 22nd, as the uh, Sanctity of Human Life Sunday. And for the last 38 years since then, uh, we have been honoring and talking about the importance of life on the Sanctity of Human Life Sunday. Now, normally I will at least mention it, um, but rarely have I devoted the teaching time like I'm going to today to this subject of the Sanctity of Human Life. But I felt led to do it for three reasons. Number one, I don't think the church has always done a good job navigating the sensitive and controversial subjects like abortion, like same-sex marriage, uh, like gender dysphoria. And I think the reason why the church hasn't done the best job navigating these sensitive topics is because either some churches lean into the compassion and love and grace for people and in the process often deny the truth of God's word on the topic in an effort to care about people or, or the church has really leaned into the truth of the Bible on a topic and denied people the kind of love and compassion and grace that they need in an effort to be right. And my question is, why can't it be both? Why can't, on the topic of abortion, we talk with grace towards women and what I call the forgotten fathers affected by abortion, and at the same time also talk about truth? I mean, isn't this what Jesus did? When you look into John chapter 8, you don't need to turn there, but there's a familiar story to many of you, I'm sure, where there's this woman caught in adultery. And in John chapter 8, the woman is hauled before Jesus by some of the townsmen and some of the religious leaders, and they demand to know from Jesus what her sentence should be. And so they say in John chapter 8, they say to Jesus, this woman here was caught in adultery. The law of Moses commands that she must be stoned to death. What do you say? And in John 8, when Jesus is confronted with that question, the Bible says that Jesus stooped down and started to write with his finger in the dirt. Now, nobody really knows what he wrote. And people have speculated maybe he was writing the names of some of the men who were standing there accusing the woman and he was listing their sins. I don't know. You know, maybe he was, I think, well, I wonder if he was just killing time while he could pray. You ever been in a situation like that? I like, guess a little volatile right here. God help me right now. What am I supposed to do? But either way, the Bible says that when Jesus finished writing whatever he did in the dirt with his finger, he stood up and then he said to all the accusers and condemners who were ready to stone her to death, you who are without sin, cast the first stone. It was brilliant. It was just like the wisdom from above, of course, because it's the embodiment of wisdom in our Lord. And the Bible says that when he said that, you who are without sin, cast the first stone, that they started to leave one by one, the older ones first. Why do you suppose that is? Because the longer you've lived, the more aware you are of your sin. They started leaving one by one. And then Jesus was alone with this woman, and he said to her, woman, where are your accusers? Who condemns you? And everyone was gone, so she said, no one. And he said, neither do I condemn you. Now, if he had stopped there, Jesus might be accused of being soft on the truth. But he added right after that, go and sin no more. You see, he led with grace, but he also told her the truth. He said, I don't condemn you. You know, the Son of Man came not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He died on a cross for all of us because all of us are sinners. But we need to understand what sin is 
So he led with grace, but he also told her the truth. If this is sin, you have to stop this. And I hope that what I have to say today comes across in the same spirit of Jesus, leading with grace, but also talking about this in a truthful way. The second reason I feel led to talk about this today is because the topic of abortion is in our headlines like never before, because right now before the U.S. Supreme Court is a very important case, the Dobbs case, the Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Organization. The court has already heard oral arguments. They are now making a decision about it. Their decision will be published by June or maybe sooner of this year, and it's possible that depending on how they're ruling, it's possible they might overturn Roe v. Wade and send the abortion topic back to the states. And that, that could save literally thousands of lives. Do you know that since 1973, when abortion was made legal in the United States, there have been nearly 64 million babies aborted. And so this is a pivotal case and we need to be praying for the justices right now as they're deliberating and making the decision on this. The third reason I felt led to share this topic today is because I'm not only interested in caring about the women and what I call the forgotten fathers affected by abortion in the past, but I also have a burden for those who are contemplating an abortion now. And my hope is that if just spending 30 minutes talking about this subject will prevent one abortion, that's one life saved, and it's worth it. And I started thinking as I was preparing for today, and I actually got a little emotional thinking about it, that wouldn't it be wonderful if, say, 15 years from now, you know, maybe I'll be in a nursing home, I don't know, but 15 years... <laughs> 15 years from now, some teenager comes up to me and says, you gave a message 15 years ago, and my mom decided to keep me. And I would weep and praise God, because every life is important. So this is an important topic today, and this is what we're gonna talk about. No shame, no condemnation, grace leading, but also with truth. So let's pray first. Father, we come before you thankful for your love and your grace in our lives. Pray now that in the same spirit of Jesus, that you would help me, Lord, to communicate in a way that translates this to the heart of men and women and young people. So that there might be healing for those who have had abortions and there might be the prevention of one abortion at least, Lord, from someone contemplating it in the future. And that you would be glorified in all things. We love you and we praise you together in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. I would like to read just a portion, not all of it, but just a portion of the original proclamation in 1984 by President Ronald Reagan when he declared the Sanctity of Human Life Sunday for the first time. This is in part what he wrote. The values and freedoms we cherish as Americans rest on our fundamental commitment to the sanctity of human life. The first of the unalienable rights affirmed by our Declaration of Independence is the right to life itself, a right the Declaration states has been endowed by our Creator on all human beings, whether young or old, weak or strong, healthy or handicapped. We have been given the precious gift of human life, made more precious still by our births in or pilgrimages to a land of freedom. It is fitting then on the anniversary of the Supreme Court decision in Roe v. Wade that struck down state anti-abortion laws that we reflect anew on these blessings and on our corresponding responsibility to guard with care the lives and freedoms of even the weakest of our fellow human beings. Now therefore, I, Ronald Reagan, President of the United States of America, do hereby proclaim Sunday, January the 22nd, 1984, as National Sanctity of Human Life Day. I call upon the citizens of this blessed land to gather on that day in homes and places of worship, to give thanks for the gift of life, and to reaffirm our commitment to the dignity of every human being and the sanctity of each human life. Amen. Life matters to God. Your life matters to God. Every life matters to God. Why do you think that in John 3, 16, probably the most quoted verse in all of the Bible, it says, for God so loved the world 
that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. God so loved the world, not a small segment, segment of it, not a specific population of it, the entire world because God loves life. And he sent his son to die for all people because all are valuable and have worth and dignity in the eyes of God. I'm going to do a quick survey with you of just 10 passages of Scripture through the Bible. I'm going to go in actually in chronological order that emphasize something about life in the Bible. This is from Genesis to Revelation, and I'm going to actually need a little uh, audience participation because here's what I want to do. I'm going to read the first part of the statement, and then where it is underlined, I want you out loud to say the underlined words. And so, for example, I'm going to say God created us with the, and then you're out loud going to say breath of life. And we're just going to go down these, this quick survey of 10 things through the Bible. This is chronological from Genesis to Revelation. So say your part out loud. Number one, God created us with the, his word instructs us in the, he is the, when we get saved, we walk in, he is the, he is the, Word of life. we will be given the, Crown of life. our names are written in the, Book of life. we will eat from the, Tree of life. and we will drink from the, Water of life. do you get the idea that God loves life? It's all through the Bible, from the time he breathes life into humanity until the time that we spend eternal life with him. And the value that he sees in us is not just after we are born. And frankly, it's not even just when we are conceived. It's even before that. Jeremiah the prophet would write in Jeremiah 1 verse 5, and he would be speaking from the standpoint of God in the first person about the calling that was on Jeremiah's life. This is what Jeremiah wrote in John, uh, Jeremiah 1 5. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you before you were born. God says about Jeremiah, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. It's amazing. Jeremiah says there that God had chosen him as a prophet before Jeremiah was even conceived. Isaiah writes something similar in Isaiah 49 verse 1. He says, the Lord has called me from the womb, from the matrix of my mother. He has made mention of my name. God even knows your name before you are conceived. David would write in Psalm 22, verse 10, from my mother's womb, you have been my God. And then that famous passage that many of us are familiar with out of Psalm 139, verse 13, for you created my inmost being, you knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. And verse 16, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. That's incredible to think of how God saw us and knew us even before we were conceived. That all the days ordained for us were written in his book before one of them even came to be. The day of our birth, he also knows the day of our death and every day in between. By the way, that should bring great comfort to us too. You know, you had no say over your birth, but you're born. And uh, one day we're gonna die and God knows that appointed day. And you can take comfort. It's not gonna be sooner than your appointed day. You know, sometimes I get in an airplane and I'm like, I wonder if this is the day. You know what I'm saying to you? And then, and then God, you know, God comforts me. And he's like, okay, all the days ordained for you written in your book before one of them came to be. Okay, it's not, but what if it's another passenger's day? You know what I'm saying to you? Like that. <laughs> That's a little disconcerting to me, but, but that's just God. He knows the beginning of your birth. He knows the end of your life, everything in between, and even before you're conceived. I think it would be more accurate to say, I'm not just pro-life, I'm pro-pre-life, because that's what God is. God is pro-life even before you are conceived. That's what Jeremiah says. That's what Isaiah says. That's what David says. This is what the Bible presents to us. So all of this that I just read to you and other passages in the Bible counters the more modern notion that life begins at birth. You know, the Bible says that life begins at conception and that God knows you even before that. 
But for those of you who are less convinced by theological evidence and more convinced by biological evidence, I want to refer a, to you uh, a study to you that was done in 2018 by the University of Chicago. This was not widely known. I think many of you might be startled to learn this, um, but I think, you know, I'm one of these guys that just scratch my head and wonder, I'm not one of these conspiracy guys, but I'm at least one of these, hmm, that causes me to wonder guys, okay? Like who's controlling the narrative about this and who's controlling the narrative about that? You might be stunned to know that in 2018, the University of Chicago did this study to answer the question, when life begins. You can Google it, look up the whole study. But here's what they did. They took 2,899 American adults and they first surveyed them. Almost 2,900 American adults surveyed them and asked them to select the group most qualified, in their opinion, to answer the question of when a human's life begins. The majority of them, 81% selected biologists. The majority justified their selection by describing biologists as objective scientists that can use their biological expertise to determine when a human's life begins. Now, I won't take offense at it. They didn't want to choose theologians or pastors. What does the Bible say? This is just the, generally the mind of America's population. We want to hear from some reliable, credible scientists. So they chose biologists. So the University of Chicago then selected academic biologists, they recruited 5,502 biologists from 1,058 academic institutions, including biologists who self-identified as very pro-choice, very pro-life, very liberal, very conservative, strong Democrats, and strong Republicans. And after they were presented with the evidence and the question of when does human life begin? Listen to this, here's the number. Overall, 95% of all biologists affirmed the biological view that a human's life begins at fertilization. At conception, 5,212 biologists out of 5,502 said, scientifically speaking, life begins at conception. Now, the world's narrative is that's a religious view. That's a religious view. Now, I'm here to tell you it's a scientific view, at least by this study, 95%. I mean, that's a, the vast majority of biologists in this study said, no, 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 scientifically speaking, life begins at conception. Dr. Landrum Shettles, MD, PhD, was the first scientist to succeed at in vitro fertilization. And he wrote a book, Dr. Shettles wrote a book called Rights of Life, The Scientific Evidence for Life Before Birth. It was published in 1983. This quote I'm gonna take actually happens to be on page 40, and here it is. Dr. Shettles said, quote, zygote is a term for a newly conceived life after the sperm and the egg cell meet, but before the embryo begins to divide. The zygote is human life. There is one fact that no one can deny, human beings begin at conception. This is not just a religious view. So in 1973, when the U.S. Supreme Court was hearing oral arguments in the Roe v. Wade case, they had to wrestle with this question of when does life begin? Because, you see, since we are endowed by our Creator, it's fundamental to our founding documents, endowed by our Creator with certain unalienable rights. Among these, first and foremost, is life, and then liberty, and then the pursuit of happiness. The Supreme Court had to make a decision and answer a question because it was not only a moral question and a biological question, it was a legal question. Because the question is, when is a human being really a human being and thus entitled to legal protection. So they had to wrestle with this question, when does life begin? And the general consensus among the majority, the majority opinion in Roe v. Wade was 7-2, the majority opinion was basically that around the third trimester, let's agree that that's when life 
is entitled to legal protection. And the reason why they settled on roughly the third trimester is because of the word that most of you are familiar with, if you have studied any of this, viability. Viability. That's the key word. The reasoning was that if a life has a good chance of surviving, then it should be legally protected. Before that, it has no legal protection. Now, in, in my mind, and this is just, you know, not a legal expert, just somebody who's like trying to understand that, that seems a bit arbitrary to me. And the reason it seems arbitrary to me is because I think about a number of people in our world today who um, really could not survive without the regular attentive care of other people in their lives. The elderly, the terminally ill, little children, those who are mentally or physically disabled. I mean, what are we to do, kill them too? So viability is a very obscure term. Now, as a result though, the third trimester abortions were declared to be legal only if the pregnancy threatened the life or health of the mother. So that's generally what Roe v. Wade decided. Third trimester, life is viable, so we'll protect it, and thus, except for some danger to the health of the mother, um, abortions will only be legal in the third trimester if there's some threat to the health of the mother. Why is it then and many of you may not know this, but why is it then that with the exception of Texas, because Texas just recently passed stricter abortion laws that were recently upheld, at least for now, by the U.S. Supreme Court, why is it then that in 49 out of 50 states in the United States of America, a woman, you may not know this, a woman can still get an abortion through the entire ninth month of her pregnancy up until the day that baby is born? Did you know that? And why is that? Well, because as a result of Roe v. Wade and other subse subsequent cases, uh, like uh, Doe v. Bolton, the language of the, of the justices became broad so that it's difficult to define what is a threat to the health of the mother. And in the Doe case, uh, Justice Harry Blackman wrote the majority opinion, and he said, quote, a woman's health includes her physical, emotional, psychological, and familial well-being and should include considerations about the woman's age. All these factors may relate to health, Blackman wrote. Giving, then, quote, the attending physician the room he needs to make his best medical judgment, end quote. In other words, if a woman is sufficiently upset about her third trimester pregnancy, her doctor has the necessary legal basis to abort. That's the way the law is right now. Now, in answer to the question or the argument, well, what about my body, my choice? My body, my choice. Now, I have to be honest with you. When the COVID vaccine mandates started being handed out, <laughs> um, and again, and again, because I can't tell you how many times I've been misquoted on this, I'm all for you making a personal decision about the vaccine. I just personally have a problem about the mandates, okay? And so, so having a personal problem with the mandates uh, I started saying to myself, government, like, what are you talking about? Get out of my life, my body, my choice. And I was like, oh. <laughs> I'm saying the same thing that the pro-choice people have been saying in their argument to support abortion. My body, my choice. So, so is, is, is there a, a contradiction here? Is there some hypocrisy here? Because, you know, we're quick to say, wait a minute, not your body, not your choice. And now I'm going, my body, my choice. So, so like, how do we reconcile this? And here's the big difference, okay? The big difference is I can enjoy my right to life so long as it doesn't inflict injury on another's right to life. That's the difference. We do have freedoms in the United States. Our Constitution guarantees it. Ethics demands it. But our rights end when our choices injure others, when our freedoms interfere with another person's right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness themselves. A woman does have the right 
to control her body. She should be allowed to make her own choices. But when she becomes pregnant, you see, now another person's body is involved. If she has an abortion, it won't just affect her body, but also the body of the child inside of her. And let me just highlight a quick couple of things about how fearfully and wonderfully we are made. We have long known that a preborn baby's heart is beating at three weeks after conception. One study found that a baby's heart may start beating even earlier at just 16 days. At six weeks, he or she has a brain that is giving off brain waves. At just under seven weeks, he or she is, responds to touch. And by eight weeks, he or she can have the hiccups. If she is a girl, she has ovaries of her own. Even at 10 weeks, the baby has unique fingerprints. They are different from those of anyone who's ever lived or ever will live. He or she can also suck his or her thumb. And he or she is a unique individual who has never existed before and will never exist again. This is how we are fearfully and wonderfully made. But now, some of you are thinking, what about me though, because it's too late for me. I've already had an abortion or maybe you've had more than one and you're struggling with this whole topic and you're feeling the weight of, of what has happened in your life. And I just wanna say a few things to you. Number one, Jesus died to forgive us of our sin and our shame. Every single one of us is in need of Jesus' forgiveness. I don't care what you've ever done. We all need his forgiveness. Sin has the natural tendency to produce shame in our lives. That's, that's the coexistence of the two. When we sin, we feel shamed. Unless you don't have a conscience, that's called a sociopath. But basically, when you do something wrong, you feel guilty. And the beautiful thing is that when Jesus died on a cross, he died to take away our sin and our shame. He paid the price. And some of you just need to know that there's forgiveness in Jesus. And some of you just need, need to hear that God loves you, that he sees and knows your life. He sees and knows my life. He sees our sins. He's aware of it. This is not new to him. This is why he sent Jesus to die. He loves you so much that he died for you. You need to hear that and know that he loves you. But see, it's more than just hearing it. You need to receive it. You can hear all day long, God loves me and God forgives me and Jesus died on the cross from our sins. But until you receive it, it's just a theory for you. If you want it to be experiential, you have to say in response, thank you Jesus for dying for me. I know what I did in your eyes is a sin, but I thank you that you died for all my sins. Please Lord, forgive me of my sin. Heal, heal my heart of the shame and the guilt. Take this away. That's what Jesus does. Jesus still forgives. Jesus died on a cross to free us from shame and guilt. The Bible says in Romans 8, 1, there is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. The Bible says in Romans 10, verse 11, anyone who trusts in the Lord will not be put to shame. This is what Jesus came to do for us. And God wants you to hear it and receive it. The second thing that I want to say to you is just a word of comfort to you is that the baby that was aborted is now in heaven. Your baby's in heaven. Now, you know, when you look at the Bible and you try to understand what heaven is like, it seems that the Bible suggests that there will be like a universal age in heaven. So your baby is still not going to be this infant, but you will know and you will recognize. There will be this universal age. When you look at different parts of the Bible, it seems to indicate maybe 30 is like the universal age in heaven, which is wonderful news if you're 90 and kind of a bummer if you're 15. <laughs> but, but you're gonna see your child again. If you know Jesus, you're gonna see your child again in heaven. How do we know this? There's a passage in 2 Samuel chapter 12. King David had this adulterous affair with Bathsheba the result of which was a baby that died in infancy. And the Bible says that David went to the house of the Lord and fasted, wept, and pled with God, please save my baby's life. But at the end of the day, that baby died. And David got up, broke his fast, stopped crying, and his attendants came to him and said, why the change of heart? You know, when your baby was sick but still alive, you were weeping. Now your baby has died and you're not. Why? And David said in 2 Samuel 12, verse 23, 
Now my, my baby is dead. Why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? And then he adds, I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. And David understood that one day when he died and he went to be with the Lord, that that's where he would be reunited with his infant baby. And so it'll be with you. Your, your baby is in the arms of Jesus right now. And you will see your child again if you go to heaven and there will be a glorious and wonderful reunion. The third thing that I wanna to say to you is, one day, maybe not now, but one day your life story might actually minister to someone else in a similar situation. I've heard countless stories of people that have been through the pain of an abortion not knowing better, then coming to understand, receiving Christ's forgiveness, their life was changed, and then God used them to minister to other people in similar situations. Today, by the way, as you heard earlier in the atrium, we have a couple of ministries, Mosaic and CareNet, and those are two wonderful places to get involved and, and to find some ministry there. But I also wanted to point out one other thing that we offer here at Cornerstone, and it is a Bible study fellowship uh, for women who have had abortions led by women. It is a very discreet group. They don't even meet here on site at the church. They meet off site. Um, it, you can connect with them. There, is, uh, there are brochures out at our kiosks at the west or the east. You can pick up one of these brochures, one of these little pamphlets that, that talk about it. And uh, it's a, it's, it, it starts on March the 21st on Monday evenings, and it goes until May the 9th. And it's an opportunity to come together with other women who have been through similar experiences and to really receive healing. It's called Surrendering the Secret. And, uh, and the, uh, Cynthia's uh, email address, her personal email is on the brochure. Again, so you don't even have to email through the church. But this can be very private and discreet and uh, you can connect with Cynthia and these, and these other women and be a part of this group and it might really be beneficial to bring healing to your heart. I wanna say a couple of things in closing. As I said earlier, in addition to caring for men and the forgotten fathers that have been affected by abortion, I also just wanna make a final appeal to those of you who might be considering one right now and asking you to choose life to choose the option of adoption. If you feel like you, this is a troubling pregnancy to you and you don't know how you're gonna raise a child, then, then consider the option of adoption because there are plenty of people who would love to open up their hearts and their homes to your child. Consider that. And then one final story. I heard about a woman who had an unplanned pregnancy. She had already had two children and she didn't want the third that she was now pregnant with. Well, one night she decided she would self-abort. So she put her two children that she had had, she put them to bed, and then she went into the kitchen and she boiled a metal coat hanger to sterilize it. She then lied down on her kitchen floor on a blanket and she attempted to abort her baby. Fortunately, it didn't work and she was rescued by a friend and she then spent the next many days in the hospital as a result of her attempted abortion. And 21 days after that, a little baby boy was born. And that boy is a friend of mine. And he pastors one of the largest churches in California now. And his name is Pastor Jack Hibbs of Calvary Chapel, Chino Hills. Jack was a, a botched abortion. But he's led thousands of people to Jesus because God's purposes never fail. The child that you're carrying, the child that you will carry has great purposes and you never know 
how the Lord might use him or her. Choose life. You'll be blessed for doing it. I want to pray for those of you who have just been deeply impacted and ask for God's healing touch in your life. So I'm going to close with a word of prayer. If you would, bow your heads with me. And I just want to pray over you Psalm 103, verses 2 to 4. Psalm 103, verses 2 to 4. Just listen to this and receive this. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from destruction, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies. Lord, this is my prayer. For those who have been personally impacted by abortion, that you would minister these verses to their hearts. That you do forgive all our sins, Lord. You heal every shameful, sinful, guilty thing of our hearts. Heal them, Lord. May they receive your forgiveness and your healing touch upon their lives, upon their hearts, upon their minds in Christ Jesus. Thank you for redeeming our lives from destruction. There is purpose and value and worth in every human being. And thank you, Lord, for crowning us with your loving kindness and tender mercies. For those, Lord, who are hurting or broken, Lord, I pray that you would just touch them today. Minister to them, Lord, your tender mercies. For those who are contemplating an abortion, Lord, help them to know that choosing life will bring blessing. That you will help them because that child has a purpose and value and worth. That you've known us, Lord, even before we were conceived in our mother's womb. Thank you, Lord, for loving us and choosing us and dying for us. Forgive us, Lord, for the, the stain of abortion on our nation and bring healing and grace to those who have been impacted by it. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen and amen. God bless you all.